Let's pray together and ask the Lord's help this morning. Father, we just we are again not here to inform you. You know all things. Before a word can leave our tongue, you know it entirely. But we are here to acknowledge you in all of our ways so that you can direct our path. We acknowledge that you can work in the ministry of teaching and preaching. You can work in the ministry of testimony and song and thanksgiving. You work in the process of our mind being renewed. And what we want to experience this morning is we want to experience the ministry of grace and truth of your Holy Spirit. We want to, we want to, we want to be transformed into your likeness. We want to experience you through our gathering. And we want, you, we want your manifested presence to cause a grace to emanate from us. So that like when Moses came down off the mountain in his time with you, we would radiate your goodness. We would radiate your righteousness. We would radiate to those around us that your, that your, your presence dwells within us through your Holy Spirit. That's our desire in this time. And because you're willing to work with us in this, that's our hope. That you're, because you're perfect and your wisdom is so perfect, you can overcome even our limitations. And I ask, Father, according to your own will, that you help work through me, help, work, help those hearing to hear through your help, so that your thoughts and our understanding can become one. And we can, and in that, we'll be changed and renewed and strengthened and encouraged with the direct result being we'll radiate the grace you want us radiating for your own glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Open to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And let's start reading together at verse 15. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespasses of the one man, death reigned through the one man, well, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? I'd like the focal point of what, we're, what, what we, we want to think about this morning to be verse 17, where it says... How much more will those who receive, the way our translators translate, when you usually see those who receive, it's usually in the form of a present participle in the Greek. And I like, I like to say it, I think it's more appropriate to say those receiving, presently, currently receiving. Because you, you don't, I don't think you get the present tense of it as much as just those who receive. Is that one time? Paul is saying those who are receiving two things. Notice the two things it says those who are receiving. Because we want to reign in life. This is a great need of our hour to have Christians with the power of Christ reigning in life. Radiating joy. Radiating peace. Having peace and righteousness in their home, emanating in their marriages, emanating in their workplace, where 
Grace is just reigning in them. And so, the, but there's two things to the, to, that need to be currently being received in order to reign in life. What are they? Two things are mentioned in verse 17 so that we can reign in life. What are the two things? All right, have you noticed that? You know what I think that it's easy for us to receive? Most of us are experts in having received the free gift of righteousness. We've got that down. We know we're forgiven. We know our sins are forgiven. We know that Christ accomplished that through his death on the cross. But I'm afraid that we're not near as adept at comprehending that there is an abundance of grace. See, it's not just receiving the free gift of righteousness. Are you receiving the abundance of grace? What do you get from the idea of abundance? It's far more than you need. Do you realize that God's grace, that's really what it is, it's far more than you ever need for any situation. You're never lacking. It's never even close. He makes sure there is more grace there than you even need. That's why it's called an abundance. And you know what makes sweet about abundance? Because when you have abundance, not only do you have everything you need, you have enough to share with others. See, when Christians are barely getting by on their own, what grace do they have to share with others? So you see, and that's been the problem. When you're limping through life saying, Jesus is with me, what testimony is that? But when you're walking in the abundant grace of God. Now, read with me. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Actually, chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It's verse 8. Here it is again. When I begin to discover two things about grace. The first thing I want to talk about grace this morning is, when Paul talks about grace, it's either the abundant grace, or the riches of grace, or the fullness of grace, or the power of grace, but it's... it's it's always beyond what we need. Look here, verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. I mean, abound to you. Not to preachers. Not just to the church in general. He is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things. What does that cover? <laughs> that covers your marriage. That covers your job. That covers your parenthood. That covers... That covers your relation with every person on the face of this earth. In every situation you're in, God makes His grace abound there. That's, that's amazing. It is amazing grace, isn't it? But it's beyond just being forgiven. We have that part. We, we understand the free gift of righteousness. We need to comprehend the abundance of the grace that God makes available. He's able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times. It's not just on Sundays. Grace abounds to you all the time. Wherever you are, whenever you are, whatever you're doing, great, an abundant supply of grace is there, so that you having all that you need, you will abound. And that, that's reigning in life. How are you doing today? How often is that your answer? How are you doing today? I'm abounding. <laughs> I'm abounding. Well, if, if God supplies an abundance of grace at all times, in all things, then you really do have an answer. If you're really living in this abundant grace of God, you can say, I'm weak, but I'm abounding. I'm hard-pressed, but I'm abounding. God's grace is sufficient. Where is God's grace sufficient in? God's grace is made perfect in our... So even our weakness is not the problem. 
Matter of fact, turn with me. You're, if you're in Second Corinthians, flip flip back a couple of chapters to chapter um, four. In chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, it says, we'll start with verse 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Now we all know, who are the earthen vessels? We are. We are. Okay, we've got that down. And we, we know our own weakness. But why are we called the earthen vessels? What is the emphasis that Paul is placing on here? Is he trying to stress how weak we are? Or is that just, a, that's just kind of a point of fact statement, is it? What's the point he's making? That even though we're just earthen vessels, what should be the clear manifestation? That the all-surpassing power coming from us is of God. That's the testimony of those who are receiving the abundance of grace. If you are currently receiving the abundance of grace, you're abounding in all things. And, and it's clear from watching you, God's power is at work in you. Not just that you're weak. It's that despite your weakness, there's an amazing power in your life. That's, that's the testimony we want. That's, what, that's the testimony we have when we're receiving the abundance of grace. So I want you to get it in your mind. I want to have it in my own heart and mind that grace is abundant. It's always more than we need. And then now I want to go back to where we started, back to Romans chapter 5. And I want us to look at another aspect of grace. Verse 15 again. Romans chapter 5, verse 15. That's where we started. Let's go back there. And I want you to notice something about grace. And as I read, I want you to tell me where the grace of God is. The grace of God is not some kind of ethereal concept that mysteriously He gives to us. The grace of God is in a very concrete direct and specific place. See if you can see where that is. Verse 15 with me as we read down. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned to that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Now, let's see if you can answer this question. Where is the grace of God? Absolutely. It's, it's a person. You don't split a person up and get pieces of him. You get him all or none. All of the grace of God is in Christ. And he's already been given. He's already given. Now look with me and you'll see this. Look in, Paul's telling Timothy this. Look in 2 Timothy chapter 1. This came to me as I listened to a person praying, actually praying in unbelief. They were struggling for faith. They were wrestling. And they kept, and they weren't praying. It was not a bad prayer, but I realized they were missing something. They were praying, Father, have mercy. Father, have mercy. And I was praying with them and longing for them to receive help. And it arose in my spirit, receive the Son. Christ is the mercy of God. Receive Him. It says to all who received Him, what did He give? 
He just says he came to his own and his own received him not, but to all who received him. What did he give? Power to become sons of God. If you want to receive the mercy of God, you must receive it in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the mercy of God. He is the love of God. He is the grace of God. He is the power of God. He is the wisdom of God. And when you have him, you have it all. That's the truth of the New Testament. That's what we need to see. It's not just, a, it's not just undeserved favor. It is a person. We didn't deserve God sending his son. Christ is the favor of God. He, the word says, he who has the son has what? Life. He who has not the son shall not, will not see life. Now here in 2 Timothy chapter 1, well, I'll at least have a voice for one day. Praise the Lord. I don't care. It's worth it to have it for one day. I'll maybe I'll get it back by next week. Verse 8, 2 Timothy chapter 1. So don't be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner. But join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us where? You see? It's all there. Now notice, not only notice that it was given us in Christ, would you read the verse again and, read, and pay attention to the tense? Was given. Are you going to ask God for grace? He's given it. God has given grace. Receive it. Receive what He has given. He has already given His Son. And if you receive the Son, you receive the grace of God. And I'm gonna, we're going to talk about that a little more. But let's look again in verse, same book. Chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Someone read for me verse 1 of chapter 2. <coughs> you see where it is, David? Right there. Christ Jesus. So we're not, we should not be asking God to give us things He has already given. We should do what Jesus said. Come unto me. All ye that are weary and heavy laden, I am the grace of God, he's saying. Come unto me, I'll give you rest. The Father has given it all to me. You come to me. When you come to me, you get it all. Just you want to bring that cup of water over there? Isn't that sweet? Isn't that sweet? Now, how do you, this is where we need to be. So what are we doing then for the rest of this life? If it's all given to us in Christ, let me give you, let, let me show you something that so excites me that uh, and I've seen it before, but it's still neat that it excites me. Look in First Corinthians chapter two. First Corinthians chapter two. First Corinthians chapter two. Let's start in verse 6 so we can get to the, get the context of this passage. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature. Not of the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom. A wisdom that has been hidden. Hmm, hidden. Where do you think that wisdom is hidden? In Christ. We'll see that. That's where it's hidden. That's why, and that's why it's not seen. People are looking for it all over, but until they find Christ, they'll never find that wisdom. A wisdom that has been, has been hidden and that God destined for our glory. And brothers and sisters, God has destined Christ for our glory. None of the rulers of this age has understood it. 
For if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. However, it's written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love them. But God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among man knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. And we have received the spirit of, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. And brothers and sisters, look and see why we have received the spirit who is from God. Why have we received it? Right. That we may understand what, Anne? The, right. The things he has already given. Do you see what the ministry of the Holy Spirit really is? The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to reveal to you what God has already given you in Christ. He's to reveal to you what God has already given. And you know what God has given you in Christ? You want to hear, see an incredible truth. Turn to the book of John. The Gospel of John. Chapter 16. Jesus 16 14. <laughs> I have to find it now. You think so? Where's what verse 14? Huh? It's good for me to be humble. <laughs> It says, I'll quote it, and then we'll find it. Okay, you guys help me find it. Let me quote it. It says, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what the Father tells Him. And He will take from what is mine. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. Who is that? Verse 13. Of chapter 16. right? Yeah, okay, I thought it was chapter 16. I was just looking in the wrong place. If you could see why, look at my notes here. This is my, I get lost in there sometimes. So my lines were, were in the wrong places. I, I couldn't pick which runway to land on here. But at um, verse 13 there, verse, we'll start from verse 12, chapter 16, verse 12. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He won't speak on his own, but he will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. Guess what belongs to Jesus? Next verse. All things. All things. Can you see why, can you see why Paul is saying he's able to make all things abound to you? Why? Why is God able to make all things abound to you? Because He's already given the Son all things. And who has He given the Son to? Us. For unto us a Son is born. Unto us a Son is given. He's not just given there. He's given unto us the government's on His shoulders. His name is Counselor. We've been given counsel. We've been given peace. He's the Prince of Peace. We've been given the mighty God Himself. For God was in Christ. All the fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily in Christ. And you have been given fullness in Christ. See, this is what... The, we don't need more principles. We need to understand Christ. We need to know Christ. We need to be drawn into communion with Christ. When, when we're like Paul, when we can say, I died, and the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. Who lives in me? Christ 
lives in me. When Christ is living in you, all that the Father had given in Him is being made known to you by the Holy Spirit. And really, you know what you really grow in? It's not that you're given anymore. It's all been given already. What you grow in is the awareness of what God has already given. Are you there? You just grow up into realizing you're rich. You grow into an appreciation of everything God has already done and already given. Now how pathetic would it be for a man to live on the street as a beggar when he had the riches of eternal glory at his disposal every day? It's just as sad for a Christian to be overcome by the world when Every, all the fullness of the Godhead has been made available to him in the person of Jesus Christ. For this reason, we should be a people. And let me kind of explain how this... Let's go with me just a, a few minutes more, would you, in Colossians. I don't want to spend a lot of time there, but... We've, we've quoted this. So I want, to, I want to go there. Colossians chapter 2. Verse 6 of chapter 2 of Colossians. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live where, guys? In Him. You see it? Learn that. Those are the two most powerful words in the New Testament. So that whosoever believeth in Him, living in Him, the, this is where life is, in Christ. So that continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends upon human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than upon Christ. For in Christ, this is where I quoted earlier, in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And verse 10 says, and you, that means you and I, have been given what? Fullness. Already given. Already done. So it's time to start appropriating all the riches that are already there. And stop living as if we're spiritual paupers. We are not. Grace has been made to abound to us. And if we are receiving the abundance of grace, you know what we're doing? We're reigning in life. Now how we do this, it's, and how this accomplished, you know, the law was, was good in its, in its way, in its own way, but compared to having all the fullness of the Godhead in Christ, you know what the law is? Weak and beggarly. Weak and beggarly elements. Because let's look at it this way. The law, in the law, where was the presence of God in the law? It was behind a curtain as thick as a man's hand. And the rule in the law said, no one shall see God and live. Uh, one day a year, a high priest was allowed to enter the set-apart of the set-apart place called the Holy of Holies. And he couldn't go in there without blood. And when he went in there, he had to take a censer of coals and incense right before he went behind the curtain. He had to put this this uh, incense upon the coals so that it would billow up because he was specifically told he must not see the mercy seat lest he die. But you know, when that, you know what now the gospel says? You had better see Jesus or you will die. When you see Jesus, what have you seen? The Father. 
Now it's not only no man shall see God and live, now it's unless you see God in Christ, you'll die. Isn't that awesome? Now, I mean, that's why when Christ died on the cross, when he said it's finished, what happened? That old curtain got ripped from top to bottom, and suddenly God wasn't set apart from everyone to not be seen. Everyone now has access to God. By the Holy Spirit. Everyone can come right to God and receive everything he needs. And it's already given. Without a rope tied around. Without a rope tied around. With having a conscience purified. Having a clear conscience. We can come and, and we can approach the throne of mercy and look right in the face of God. Because you, know you, you know what God looks like? He looks like Jesus Christ. <laughs> You see the glory of God in the face of Christ. That's where you see God. That's what God looks like. God looks like Jesus. And you've been given Him already. Now saints, live like it. Live in the riches of Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to make known to you the things that the Father has already given. You know what happens? Listen to this. You want to bring glory to God? Then receive from the Spirit the things of Christ. Because Christ said, if you receive the things from the Spirit, you will bring glory to me. The last thing God wants is for him to have all this abundance and his own people not receive it. He meant for us to use it. He meant for us to have it. And he has freely given this. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that good news? Oh, I tell you. So just think, every time you come to prayer, isn't that something? Every time you come to prayer, you can't even touch the amount of grace you need. Like, would you be afraid of exhausting the, the supply of the ocean if you came with a thimble? Again and again and again? No. The Bible said, now, now listen to this. To him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or think. To him be glory in the church. If you think you're asking God for too much, you haven't begun. He's able to do immeasurably more than what you can ask or think. And you won't and the riches of grace will never know the difference. It's just amazing. And let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your goodness and kindness to, and long suffering to bring us to these places, to this place where we can see these things. Make them real, Father, to us. Help us lay hold of what you have given. Thank you that you chose to do it this way. Continue, Father, to help us to grow up into the riches of Christ that you've made given to us freely. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. We are grateful sons and daughters. And help us, Father, radiate this, this abundance this week. I know I, I just pray for all those here. I think we join in prayer together actually is the way I want to say it before you, Father. <coughs> May everyone here that has an opportunity to spend time with family members, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, aunts or uncles. Father, give us an opportunity this year to radiate the glory of Christ. Be filled with the love of Christ. And, 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 and so that we can have the testimony we're reigning in life. By your grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, God is good.